welcome back to the MMA Training Bible's Guide to Building Unstoppable Endurance in Three Months. I'm Dr. Jason Gillis. So remember, the first half of this course is all about the science of mixed martial arts, and we cover that in sessions one, two, three, four, and five. And then it gets very applied. We apply everything that we've learned in those, those first five sessions in the, in the second half of the course, in sessions six, seven, eight, nine, and 10. It's a workshop where we uh, take you through a step-by-step -step process for creating that periodized plan. So without further ado, let's get into that first session, the metabolic demands of mixed martial arts. I've got some learning objectives for you here first. First, I want you to be able to understand how food is converted to energy and what ATP is. Second, I want you to understand the ATP PCR system and what it is and how it works and how to recognize performance adaptations that result from training that particular system. I also want you to understand how anaerobic glycolysis works and specify performance adaptations that arise when you try to target that system in particular. I also want you to identify how ATP is produced in aerobic metabolism and understand performance adaptations that result from training that system. And finally, I want you to appreciate how all of these systems work together to power your efforts in the cage. And this is exactly what we're gonna cover in this video lecture. There's a couple different sections. The first thing we're gonna talk about energy metabolism basics. Then we're gonna move on to talk about the ATP PCR system, then anaerobic glycolysis, then aerobic energy metabolism, and finally we're gonna talk about how all these systems work together. So let's get started. Energy metabolism basics, what does it all mean? We're gonna to try to make this simple for you. So we eat food, and the type of food that we eat is gonna be made up of different quantities of fats, which are also called triglycerides, and carbohydrates, and proteins. Now, when you when, when all these foods, when they, when they are swallowed, they make their way to your stomach, they're gonna be break, broken down into their individual constituents. And the individual constituents of fats are triglycerides. And, and triglycerides are made of a combination of free fatty acids and glycerol. Now, when you eat carbohydrates, it's broken down in your stomach, all sorts of things act to break it down, but ultimately what it's gonna be broken down into, it's glucose. And then similarly for protein, when that's broken down in your stomach, it's broken down into amino acids. So when we eat those fats and they're broken down and, and we have those free fatty acids because that's really what's useful to us, those free fatty acids will move into your blood and then some of them will stay in your blood in what's referred to as the free fatty acid pool. And some of those, if you have a whole lot of free fatty acids in the pool, some of them will be stored as fat. So that's fat stores. Similarly, when we have a, a nice carbohydrate meal, it's broken down into glucose, a lot of that glucose will just float in our blood, float around in this glucose pool. And then some of that will be stored as glycogen and stored as glycogen inside your muscle. And it can also be stored as glycogen inside your liver. And then protein, uh, it's broken down into amino acids and those amino acids will move around the body uh, and move in the blood and that forms the amino acid pool. But it can also be stored in your body as protein and, and this is really what your muscles are made up of and there's a whole bunch of uh, actions of protein in the body we can talk more about later on in terms of metabolism our body is using free fatty acids from the free fatty acid pool glucose from the glucose pool and then amino acids from the amino acid pool but know that amino acids they really don't contribute much to metabolism so when we talk about metabolism we're just talking about how our body powers movements the little machinery that allows our body to continually act in the world. And it's all sorts of chemical reactions. So essentially what we're doing here is we're, we're breaking down these free fatty acids to power our movement. Now we can move from all, all of our stores here, whether it's fats, glycogen, uh, and body protein, those stores, we can move to the pool. And in the case of fats, we can move from fat stores to the free fatty acid pool in a process referred to as lipolysis. And we can move back from the free fatty acid pool into the stores in a process referred to as lipogenesis. The easy way to remember this is lipo means fat and then lysis means breaking down. So you're always gonna, any term that has a, a lysis at the end of it, it means breaking down. Uh, and we can also create fat stores from free fatty acids in a process referred to as lipogenesis. So if you have a big fatty meal, then you're gonna have a lot of free fatty acids floating around the body and the blood. Some of those will be converted to fat stores in a process referred to as lipogenesis. And lipo again means fat, and genesis just means creation or new. We can also 
uh, increase our fat stores if we have an abundance of glucose in the body in a process, again, referred to as lipogenesis or creating new fat stores, uh, in this case from glucose. Now, moving on to talk about uh, carbohydrates, which are broken down into glucose and then ultimately end up floating around in the glucose uh, pool. Remember, uh, glucose is stored as glycogen. It can be stored in the liver and it can be stored in the muscle. Now, when we need it, we can break down these glycogen stores in a process referred to as glycogenolysis. So that makes sense, right? Because glycogen is what we're talking about. And then lysis means breaking it down. So it's easy to figure out what that term is, just breaking down glycogen. But then we can also convert glucose into the stored form of glycogen in a process referred to as glycogenesis. Gly now you can also create glucose from amino acids. And the term here is called gluconeogenesis. So gluco meaning glucose, uh, and neo meaning new, and then genesis means the creation of. But this doesn't happen as often as, as, as some of these other processes. You can also move from body uh, protein to amino acids. You can break down your muscles, you can break down protein in your body. Uh, and this is a catabolic reaction. We can just call it protein breakdown. Or we can go the other way. We can build up body protein. We can build up our muscles in a process referred to as protein synthesis. This is what metabol metabolism is. It's all these processes lumped together. And what we want to talk about next is we want to talk about the currency of energy in the body and actually how we, we create movement in our muscles primarily. In the human body, energy is stored in a molecule, a high energy molecule called ATP, and that stands for adenosine triphosphate. So what you're seeing here, it's a, a schematic of what this molecule looks like. We have the A for adenosine, and then we have three phosphate molecules. These are inorganic phosphates all joined together. Now, they're bonded together to each other. And let me tell you that most of the energy is stored in this third bond that, that stores this third inorganic phosphate to ATP. Now, this is a high energy bond, and if we wanna perform action, if we wanna act in the world, if we wanna contract our muscles, then we need to create energy. And when we break that third bond, then we release this inorganic phosphate, and in the process, we create lots of energy. It's like a little explosion. And that little explosion, that release of energy, allows muscles to contract. But the thing to appreciate here is now you, you don't have ATP anymore. You don't have adenosine triphosphate. You don't have adenosine with three phosphates. You have adenosine diphosphate. You're missing that third phosphate. And as a result, your ability to create energy, your ability to power muscle contraction has fallen. You need to have that ATP molecule if you're gonna continue powering muscle contraction. So as you can start to see here, I hope, if you wanna uh, continue to exert high efforts in the cage, then you need to generate ATP. You need to continue to break ATP down. So my question is, what and how can we generate more ATP so that we can continue to allow our muscles to contract? Well, there's three basic ways of producing more ATP. There's three different energy systems, and these are all based on uh, enzymatic reactions in the body. So this is it. This is what we're gonna talk about in this lecture. And what we're gonna talk about first is the ATP PCR system, which allows us to move from ADP to ATP. Uh, and we'll talk about that first. We have two other energy systems. One is called anaerobic glycolysis, which can generate ATP. And the other one is called aerobic, uh, or, or aerobic glycolysis or, or aerobic energy systems uh, in general. Uh, and they also can help us generate ATP. And, and this is what we're gonna talk about in this lecture. So let's go on and talk about that first energy system, the ATP PCR system. And the ATP PCR system, it goes by a lot of different names. Um, some people call it the, the phosphagen system, but we're gonna call it the, the ATP PCR system because I think that best describes exactly what it does. So remember, this is all about creating more ATP. So let's just uh, review the process whereby energy is, is created and muscles contract again. So first, ATP is broken apart. And I didn't say this last time, but now you're ready for some more information. There's an enzyme that's responsible for splitting apart the ATP molecule, and that's referred to as ATPase. You can always tell we're dealing with an enzyme because it has that ase at the end of it. So ATPase, the enzyme, breaks apart um, ATP, and that allows muscle to contract, it releases energy. Now, this is very important 
when ATP is broken down, remember this is all happening inside our muscles. When ATP is broken, um, the inorganic phosphate and the hydrogen ion, they just don't disappear. What happens is they're released from ATP and they start to build, build up around the muscle, inside the muscle. And that's important to get. We're going to come back to that later. It's a probable cause of fatigue, this buildup of hydrogen ions and inorganic phosphate, or collectively termed metabolites. Now, separate from that, inside our muscle, we have this molecule called phosphocreatine. Now, you probably have heard of that last term before, creatine. And this is the same creatine that you supplement with. And so when you consume that creatine, you can increase the amount of creatine inside your muscle. And it, as a result, you can increase the amount of um, phosphate that binds to that. And resultantly, you can increase the whole concentration of phosphocreatine inside your muscle. You can increase the size of that phosphocreatine pool. But separate from that, how the ATP PCR system works is we have this molecule of phosphocreatine. And when we see a buildup of ADP inside the muscle, then another enzyme called creatine kinase will split apart this phosphocreatine molecule. And as a result of that, it will lend its inorganic phosphate to ADP. Remember, we're, we're talking about adenosine diphosphate. And when it receives that, that third phosphate from creatine phosphate or from phosphocreatine, we now have ATP again. And as a result of that, we can continue to, to uh, exert force. We can continue to contract our muscles. There's something else important that happens. When we rejoin that phosphate to ADP, then that hydrogen ion is gonna go back inside the, uh, the, uh, the ATP molecule. Now, uh, we'll talk more about this later, but just a, a, little, uh, a little foreshadowing. Hydrogen ions, they can increase the acidity of the muscle and that may uh, contribute to performance impairment. So when that hydrogen ion uh, moves from the muscle and goes back into the ATP molecule, you're effectively reducing the acidity of the muscle. And if you rest long enough, then ultimately what will happen is that inorganic phosphate, which was initially freed, will then join back up with another inorganic phosphate or, or another creatine molecule. And then you have that phosphocreatine molecule again. So that is how the ATP PCR system works. It just splits apart and then it donates its inorganic phosphate to ADP to form ATP so that you can continue to power muscle contractions. There's a couple more points that I wanna emphasize about the ATP PCR system. So if you recall, I said we've got a pool of phosphocreatine inside the muscle. So this is kind of depicting that pool. We have a limited pool of phosphocreatine inside the muscle. And when we're exercising at a very high intensity, somewhere between 15 seconds to 30 seconds, this entire pool of phosphocreatine will be absolutely depleted. So you're gonna run out of the ability to regenerate more ATP. So what's gonna happen is that's probably gonna impair your ability to perform at a high intensity. And it takes probably about five minutes to totally restore this, this energy system. Let's just talk about this in a little more detail. So we've broken down ATP because we're trying to contract our muscles at a very, very high rate. Uh, when we break down ATP with ATPase, we release energy uh, and it allows muscles to contract. And as a result, we get this buildup of inorganic phosphate and hydrogen ions in the muscle. Now, when you're exercising at a very, very high rate, when you're performing a lot of contractions, when you're breaking down a lot of ATP, then what can happen is you get this big buildup of hydrogen ions in the muscle, you get this big buildup of inorganic phosphate in the muscle, and this is a probable cause of fatigue when you're exercising at like very, very high intensities. Um, and we'll talk about other causes of fatigue uh, later on. But let's just finish up this little section on the ATP PCR system by talking about what can happen when you train this system appropriately. And that's what we mean when we say performance adaptations. So when you train this system appropriately, when you focus on the ATP PCR system, then you can expect your ability to, perf to perform single high intensity efforts, like takedown attempts or, or high intensity short combinations to increase. Your ability to perform more powerfully will increase. You can also expect to see an increase in the size of that phosphocreatine pool. So maybe if you're untrained, you have a phosphocreatine pool that will allow you to exercise maximally for about 15 seconds. But maybe if you train, maybe if you supplement with creatine, you can increase the size of that pool to maybe last up to, to 20, 25, or maybe 30 seconds, which is fantastic. Another thing, if you train appropriately, 
you can increase the rate that phosphocreatine is resynthesized. And we talk about phosphocreatine resynthesis, we're talking about obviously breaking phosphocreatine down is one thing, but you want to be able to get that phosphocreatine back together. You want to be able to rejoin that inorganic phosphate with the creatine as fast as possible because that means that you're ready to go again at a higher intensity. So if you train appropriately, if you use the strategies that I'll teach you in, uh, in, in this video series, then you'll get all these benefits. You'll see an increased phosphocreatine resynthesis. You'll see an increase in the size of the phosphocreatine pool. And as a result of all this stuff, you'll see ultimately an increase in the power of your single efforts, like your big takedown attempts, or if you're trying to control someone against the cage, or the power of your, your short combinations. You know, there's only enough ATP in the human body to last a couple seconds. And, and we're talking about enough ATP in the body to support normal physiological functioning, like, like your heart beating or your lungs, your diaphragm working to expand your lungs or, uh, or you know, just normal, uh, normal functions just to live. If you don't resynthesize any more ATP, then you die. So the first method for resynthesizing ATP, the easiest method, it's the ATP PCR system just by breaking that phosphocreatine molecule apart and donating uh, a phosphate to uh, ADP to, to create ATP again. But if you're working at a high intensity, that system, it's only gonna last maybe 15 seconds. We don't die after that, we keep on moving. What happens is we, we have to lower our pace and we start to increase ATP production through different energy systems. These other energy systems, they can't produce ATP at a fast rate compared to the ATP PCR system. They produce ATP at a much slower rate. And so the first energy system that I wanna talk about that achieves that, it's anaerobic glycolysis. So glycolysis, it's 10 or 11 enzymatic reactions that take place inside the cell and the cytoplasm or the sarcoplasm if you're thinking about muscle cells. Uh, and most of these, um, these biochemical pathways, they have rate limiting enzymes that prevent uh, a lot of the activity from happening. If you want to know more about this, it's definitely beyond the scope of, of this online course, but I'd suggest that you probably are, are fit for exercise science and you should probably jump in an exercise physiology course or maybe an advanced nutrition course because all this stuff is covered in way more detail there. But like I said, it's beyond the scope of what we're doing here. I just want to give you a basic understanding of the different energy systems because it really is going to be important when we start to, to focus and match up workouts to each of these energy systems. But anyway, let's go on. With glycolysis, we're always starting with glycogen or glucose. And you can get glucose from a couple different places, you can get glycogen from a couple different places, but know that in order to, to uh, use anaerobic glycolysis, you gotta start with glycogen or glucose, carbohydrates. And ultimately what you're gonna get is you're gonna, you're gonna break down these molecules and you're gonna get ATP and that's gonna be used to power muscle contraction. Sometimes I tell students to think about the analogy of a car going through a car wash. So think of glucose or glycogen going through a car wash. And the, the wipers in the car wash, they're enzymes and they're just ripping the car apart. And when they rip the car apart, there's all sorts of things flying off that car. And one of the things that flies off the car is energy. So that's kind of uh, analogous to what's happening is you're ripping these um, these, these molecules apart, glucose and glycogen, and enzymes are doing it, and they're, they're powering it. And if you don't have enough of certain enzymes, then the whole process is gonna stop. So if you got a lot of PFK, then you're good to go for your, for your car wash. You're gonna get a lot of ATP out of that, but if you don't have a lot of phosphofructokinase or PFK, then the car wash isn't gonna work very well. You're not gonna get very much ATP from glycogen or glucose. But anyway, let's give you a little overview of how these systems work. If you start with glycogen, then you're gonna get three ATP molecules at the end of glycolysis. If you start with glucose, you're only gonna get two ATP molecules, and that's because it takes a little bit of energy um, to, to just break down glucose in glycolysis. So that's why it actually takes one molecule of ATP you're burning off. So if we're looking at the total net amount of ATP we get, you're one less with, with glucose. You can have anaerobic glycolysis, and you can have aerobic glycolysis. And this confuses a lot of my students, but we're gonna to try to give you the Coles notes here. We're gonna be really, really simplistic with you. What we wanna focus on is um, anaerobic glycolysis and glycogen first, because uh, glycogen, it's found inside the muscle, and it's a very quick source for, 
for glycolysis. So we got a lot of glycogen in the muscle, we can break that down quite quickly. We also have glycogen in the liver, but it takes longer to, to break that down uh, and, and get it into the muscle. Uh, and there's a couple intermediary processes. So we like to talk about anaerobic glycolysis and glycogen. So we got glycogen in that car wash, it's going through the car wash, we break it down with all these enzymes, these enzymatic reactions, and three ATP molecules fly off of it. We get a couple of these other molecules called NADH plus H. These are just hydrogen ion carriers because um, they're gonna be there to pick up hydrogen ions that fly off uh, the glycogen through the car wash. And we also get these other molecules. These other molecules, which I want you to, to think about, remember this name, pyruvate. We get two pyruvate molecules when we break down glycogen. Pyruvate, it's converted when there's no oxygen to lactic acid. And I'm sure you've heard of lactic acid before. So my question to you is, does lactate impair performance? Now, I want you to get a piece of paper. I want you to get a, a pencil or a pen and then write down yes or no. If you think lactic acid impairs performance, write yes. If you think lactic acid doesn't impair performance, um, then say, you know, it doesn't impair performance. No, it does not. Um, let's answer that question right now. So what is the fate of lactic acid? So as a result of breaking down glycogen, ultimately uh, we're gonna get these pyruvate molecules. When there's no oxygen, these pyruvate molecules are converted into lactic acid. Now, the fate of lactic acid is it's buffered inside the muscle. It can be used around the body as well, but it can also disassociate into hydrogen ions inside the muscle. And we've talked about hydrogen ions before because those hydrogen ions, when you're exercising at a high intensity, when you're really relying on anaerobic glycolysis, those hydrogen ions can build up inside the muscle. Now, remember, whenever you break down ATP, you also have a buildup of hydrogen ions in the muscle. And when you're exercising at a very high intensity, you know, w when you're breaking down ATP a lot, when you have a lot of muscle contractions, you're gonna get a really big buildup of inorganic phosphate and hydrogen ions inside the muscle. And that is the probable cause of fatigue. It's the buildup of hydrogen ions, it's the buildup of inorganic phosphate, ultimately to increase the acidity of the muscle and that can impair excitation contraction coupling or um, we'll just say muscle contraction. So to answer the question, does lactic acid impair performance? The answer is no, it does not. Hydrogen ions, ultimately an inorganic phosphate, they're building up in intensity, they're building up and in increasing your perception of effort, they're making you feel that burn. It's not the lactic acid. When you train the system, then you will improve your ability to tolerate sustained efforts. And now when I talk about sustained efforts, I'm talking about like prolonged grappling or wrestling for body position. If you're holding someone up against the cage, for example, uh, you start to feel that burn, then you're starting to activate the anaerobic glycolytic system. So we're talking about somewhere in the region of maybe uh, 30 seconds to 45 seconds to, to 60 seconds or so. When you're in that range uh, and you train anaerobic glycolysis, then, then you may improve your tolerance. You may feel less perceptions of burn. You may also improve your ability to deal with some of those metabolites. So if you're constantly targeting the anaerobic glycolytic system, um, you're, gonna, you're gonna probably improve your body's ability to buffer those hydrogen ions, improve your body's ability to buffer those inorganic phosphates, improve your body's ability to handle lactate as well. So this is what you get when you train this system. But the problem is, you're really not gonna improve your body's ability to, to deal with these hydrogen ions for really much longer than a couple more seconds. So the anaerobic uh, glycolytic energy system, it's important to train, but you shouldn't spend all your time training this because you're only gonna improve maybe your ability to, um, to, to power sustained efforts for a couple more seconds. And how long does a typical round last? It's about five minutes. And how many rounds are there in the sport of mixed martial arts? If it's a non-title fight, you're talking about three five-minute rounds or 15 minutes in total. Title fights can be 25 minutes in total. This is not the energy system that is gonna be dominating uh, mixed martial arts performance. Incidentally, the ATP PCR system, it's not the energy system that's gonna be dominating um, efforts because we know that that's, uh, it's only dominating for up to 15 to 30 seconds, and it takes a total of five minutes to totally resupply the phosphocreatine system. So, 
Uh, the ATP PCR system, it's important for individual sustained efforts, but it's not the most important system for mixed martial arts. Anaerobic glycolysis, it's going to improve your ability to, to sustain kind of high intensity efforts, but ultimately it's not going to improve your ability to perform at a repeated high intensity over the course of a whole round and over the course of a whole fight. If we really want to master MMA endurance, then you have to master aerobic energy metabolism. And that's what I want to, uh, what I want to talk about next. So I know this is getting maybe a little bit heavy. So let's just take a second to, to rewind and let's recap just a little bit to make sure that we understand what's happening here. Glycolysis. This is um, always anaerobic. It happens in an anaerobic environment. There is no oxygen. Glycolysis is always anaerobic. And it's a series of chemical reactions that break down either glycogen or glucose and you ultimately end up getting ATP. If you start with glycogen, then you get three ATP molecules. If you start with glucose, you get two. Last time we talked about anaerobic glycolysis, which really deals with glycogen, and we showed you that uh, when glycogen goes through that car wash, which is always anaerobic, then um, ultimately you end up getting some ATP molecules. You end up getting these other things called hydrogen ion carriers, NADH plus H, or hydrogen ion carriers, and you end up getting these other molecule is called pyruvate, which ultimately are converted into lactic acid when there's no oxygen. You also have something called aerobic glycolysis. Now, certain textbooks have different names for these things. Um, some textbooks will call aerobic glycolysis uh, slow glycolysis. Some textbooks will call anaerobic glycolysis fast glycolysis because it depends uh, upon the rate that you're able to produce ATP from these energy systems. So let's talk about uh, aerobic glycolysis right now. And let me reemphasize the fact that glycolysis, it's always anaerobic. What determines whether it's aerobic or anaerobic is whether there's oxygen at the end of the whole process. So let's talk about anaerobic glycolysis. We start with glucose mostly. And in uh, aerobic glycolysis, we're gonna get two ATP molecules because it takes a little bit of energy just to start glucose being broken down in that car wash. But we also get these hydrogen ion carriers. We get these two NADH plus H molecules. We get these two pyruvate molecules. Now, the big difference is what happens to these pyruvate molecules after glycolysis. And this totally determines whether uh, glycolysis is aerobic or anaerobic. Now, if there's no oxygen present at the end of glycolysis, these pyruvate molecules will be converted to lactate. If there is oxygen, around at the end of glycolysis, these pyruvate molecules will be converted to another molecule and intermediary called acetylcoenzyme A. Let's continue on. Now, aerobic glycolysis, we know it gives us acetylcoenzyme A. That's not the end of it. We can also get acetylcoenzyme A from the process of breaking fat down or beta oxidation we can also get acetylcoenzyme A from the process of breaking amino acids down or transamination. Now, we prefer to get acetylcoenzyme A, our body does, primarily from beta oxidation, but we can also get a, a, pretty, a pretty good source from aerobic glycolysis from, from primarily glucose. Now, once we have this acetylcoenzyme A molecule, we can start to really create a lot of ATP. So first, this acetylcoenzyme A molecule enters into a, another enzymatic pathway called the Krebs cycle. And then we move on to the electron transport chain and something called oxidative phosphorylation. And then as a result, we end up getting ATP. So let's just go into a little bit more detail about the Krebs cycle. We're not going to go into a lot of detail, so don't worry. So acetylcoenzyme A, it ends up going through that Krebs cycle car wash. And there are eight chemical reactions that break apart acetylcoenzyme A. And in the process, when it breaks it apart, then you end up getting two ATP molecules. You end up getting some carbon dioxide molecules. And you end up getting some more of these hydrogen ion carriers. And there's a couple different varieties of hydrogen ion carriers. You see the NADH and the FADH. Now, what happens is we've broken down acetylcoenzyme A and now we have all of these hydrogen ion carriers floating around. And if you remember back to the previous slides with, with glycolysis, you also see a buildup of some of these hydrogen ion carriers. Now, what happens next? is we start to use all of these hydrogen ion carriers, which really are bound to all of these hydrogens. And, and we want to decrease the acidity of the cell. We want to produce a lot of energy. 
So what the electron transport chain and oxidative phosphorylation does is it starts making use of those hydrogen ions in a series of chemical reactions to ultimately break them down and you get some water and you get a whole lot of energy. Specifically, if you start with fatty acids, if you do the process of beta oxidation, you end up getting for each um, acetylcoenzyme A molecule, you end up getting 129 molecules of ATP. Compare that to one molecule of glucose or one molecule of, of glycogen. You only get either two or three molecules of ATP. If you start with glucose uh, and it's converted into uh, acetylcoenzyme A, then you end up getting 38 around, 38 molecules of, of ATP. If you start with glycogen, you're going to get one more because it costs one ATP molecule for glucose just to be broken down uh, in glycolysis. These numbers can change a little bit too depending upon how you, how you do your accounting. If you start with amino acids, you really don't get that much ATP, and that's why it's not the body's preferred source. So, uh, just to summarize here, if you want to get a lot of ATP, which is, remember, there to power muscle contraction, then you want to use aerobic energy metabolism because that will allow you to perform high intensity efforts at a prolonged period of time. Now, the thing to remember here is, is aerobic energy metabolism, it can produce almost an unlimited capacity of ATP, but it can't do it at a really, really fast rate. Uh, the ATP PCR system, that can produce ATP at like a really, really fast rate. So if you're performing very, very um, powerful efforts, the ATP PCR system will allow you to do that, but it can only do it for a very short period of time. Anaerobic glycolysis is kind of the same. It can only produce ATP for a very short period of time, but it can produce it at a little bit of a faster rate compared to aerobic energy metabolism. So what you want to do is you want to focus your training on developing all of these in the correct manner, and then you'll be able to um, do all of the things that you need to do. You'll be able to perform high intensity efforts every once in a while. You'll be able to perform prolonged high intensity efforts every once in a while. And you'll be able to do that over the course of a whole round and over the course of a whole fight. A couple more words on aerobic energy metabolism. Now, if you train this system appropriately, you will increase your ability to perform at a repeated high intensity over and over and over again. You'll also improve your body's ability to use and consume oxygen. You'll improve your body's ability to deliver oxygen to muscles and your body's ability to use it, your, your muscles' ability to use it. You may be able to uh, improve your efficiency, but um, maybe not. This I want to just finish off here and emphasize the fact that, again, all these energy systems are working together. And I'm going to try to put this all together in maybe one figure. Let me just orient you to the, to the scale. So we're looking at the vertical axis over here, and it goes from 0 to 100%. We're talking about the percent contribution to total ATP supply. And over here, we're looking at minutes of exercise. So this is just five minutes. So this is just one typical round of a, of a, of a fight. Now let's focus on the ATP PCR system. So what we're looking at here is it produces a lot of ATP for a very short period of time, but it really can't provide a sustained, um, a, a sustained contribution to ATP. So this is an example of a, a high rate uh, producing energy system with a very small capacity to produce ATP. And this is gonna be responsible for your big powerful efforts in the cage. And then we have anaerobic glycolysis which is responsible for producing a lot of ATP quite quickly, but it can't do it for very long. And then we have the aerobic energy systems, which I like to, to lump together as aerobic glycolysis and aerobic oxidation. And you see, they can produce a lot of ATP for a long period of time. So I hope uh, by the end of this lecture, and this is the last slide, we're gonna summary next. I hope that you appreciate that. ATP PCR system, it is very, very important in mixed martial arts because it's there to power those high intensity efforts. You need that if you're gonna be powerful in the cage. Aerobic glycolysis, it is important because you will find yourself in situations where you need to prolong high intensity efforts. But if you want to improve your body's ability to perform at a repeated high intensity over the course of a whole round and over the course of a whole fight, it's all about the aerobic energy systems. And I can't um, overemphasize that enough. It's really important. So let's give you a little bit of a summary here. So a couple take home points here. Food is converted into energy. ATP is the currency of energy in the human body. The ATP PCR system, it dominates explosive movements. It's really important in mixed martial arts. 
Anaerobic glycolysis supports short sustained movements, but it does contribute to this buildup of metabolites that ultimately will impair your performance. You don't wanna spend all your time there because if you do, you're gonna be gassing out. Uh, aerobic energy systems dominate mixed martial arts performance. But importantly, all of these systems work together. So if you wanna be a, a well-rounded fighter, you need to train all these systems appropriately. And that's the point of, of this whole video series. If you really, really like this stuff, if you wanna know more about it, then check out the Metabolic Demands or, or the, 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 the Bioenergetics of Mixed Martial Arts course because we go into a little bit more detail there. So that's it for session one. I hope you uh, drew a couple distinctions. And most importantly, I hope you agree with me in, uh, in thinking that the aerobic energy system, those are the most important in mixed martial arts. So I'll leave it there and I look forward to seeing you in session two.